Welcome back. As you know, I am Eli the Computer Guy, and in today's class, we are going to be creating a hardware GPS tracker using a Blues IoT modem. So this is a full tracking device here with our nice little USB battery pack. This is taking uh, the, the location based off of a GPS signal or other things we'll talk about later, sending that information up onto the internet, and we are creating a dashboard so we can see the location of this device, where it currently is. So in today's class, I'm going to be showing you the basic idea of how to build this device with the code base for the device itself and building this web application. So let me give you a little demonstration of what's going on before we get into this class. So this is a Blues dev kit. You can buy this dev kit, I think it's for about $120. Uh, with this you get the Blues modem, uh, you get the extender board, and you get an Arduino uh, feather board in order to make all of this work. Basically what's going on here is I have some code in this feather board. Uh, every five minutes it triggers an event so that it grabs the GPS value, sends it up to NoteHub's servers, or the note hub is blues servers from there it sends the information over to my server my server stores that into a sql database and then basically i'm able to go to a web page that's actually on the internet so right now it's just using a uh, internet uh IP address, but you could put a domain name in here if you wanted. Uh, but from here, we can go to a particular page, current page, and this shows me the location for this tracking device in five minute increments. So we'll talk a little bit about this particular GPS unit uh, in the future in the class. But for this, um, just to make life easier and make sure it works properly, every five minutes it sends uh, where this particular device is. And what we have here is we have an embed uh, using the Google Maps. Apps API uh, to show us where it is, right? Uh, so basically, uh, this was the location. So this is the location for Hatch. I'm at the Hatch Innovation Hub, Silicon Dojo right now. Uh, and so this is where the location is. Um, I can go down, and I was driving around before I started uh, doing this uh, doing this class. And you can see five minutes before this, I was kind of beside the five guys. Uh, before that, I was up at this particular intersection and so on. So basically what this is showing me right here is it's giving me the time code uh, for when uh, this GPS uh, location was grabbed. It's giving me the latitude and it's giving me the longitude and then it's giving me this embed right here so I can get a graphical view of what's going on. And so this is what we're going to be building today. Now you might be looking at this particular project and you're thinking, okay, this is interesting and all, but why bother with building your own tracking unit? Why not simply track people through their cell phones or whatever else? Well, one of the things that I want you to be thinking about is you need to be thinking about designing applications, designing systems for organizations and for businesses. And one of the big problems we have in the modern world is that businesses want to install their crap onto their employees telephones and things the, the, the basically the, the boss is like hey I want you to buy a thousand dollar cell phone and then install my app on it so you can do your job which creates all kinds of problems. Or on the other side of the equation, basically the employee already has something like a cell phone and the boss decides to go out and buy additional cell phones for everybody so that they can have their, their, their home cell phone and their work cell phone. And again, that's, that's a kind of a disaster on its own. So one of the things to be thinking about is basically this whole question of, of what are business leaders looking for? What are managers looking for? What are bosses looking for? And one of the big things to be thinking about in this modern world is this idea of essentially being able to track employees, uh, especially when they're not necessarily in view. Again, having been an owner, having been a manager, one of the big problems is when the employees walk out the door, you got no idea what the hell they're doing, right? I paid marketing people good money <laughs> to do something. I don't know, right? They were supposed to be field marketing. They were supposed to put up door hangers. They were supposed to knock on doors. They were supposed to do all of this stuff. And basically all I know is eight hours later, they walked in the door. I paid them their salary and I basically got no, uh, no, no leads from them, right? And that's like, that's a bit of a frustrating thing, right? If they go out there and they do their job and it doesn't work out, eh, no harm, no foul. But again, are they going out? Are they going to watch a movie? What are they doing? If you have uh, security guards, 
that are supposed to be making patrols, how can you verify that they're actually going out there and doing the patrols? Back uh, back when I used to be a security guard, uh, we had these little wands. They had like these little laser wands, and there'd be barcodes all over the building. So we'd have to scan these barcodes all over the building. Wouldn't it be nice if you could just have like this kind of device right here, and basically this is a dev kit too, an important thing to understand that this is a dev kit. So at the end of the day, you would be designing this into you know more of a product type thing. <coughs> Basically, what if you could have your employees just grab one of these things, throw it in their backpack or throw it into their whatever, and then it's tracking them around so that you can verify they're going and they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Again, if you have things like field technicians, if you have plumbers, uh, 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 electricians, uh, uh, computer repair people, uh, just seeing where your employees currently are. So again, uh, imagine if you had a secretary and there was a call, the emergency call came in, what if uh, they could look at a dashboard, again, this idea of a single pane of glass to see where all the field technicians currently are, and they could very easily go, oh, you're here, my technician is really, I can see that my technician is really close to you, so I will just call this technician to get them to come to you next, right? Being able to see a location information is just an incredibly valuable thing, again, for dealing with tasks in near real time when situations come up, verifying that the employees are doing what the hell they're supposed to be doing, and a whole bunch of other things. Being able to give the real world interactions, uh, some kind of metrics, again, on that kind of single pane of glass for managers uh, can be incredible incredibly useful. So let's talk about this particular product and the company behind it. Again, this is a company called Blues, and they're trying to transform your physical products into data-driven intelligence services. Blues simplifies wireless communication. And the concept the concept is basically you buy this modem and more or less you're done. You don't have to worry about a lot of unexpected costs. So when you buy this particular modem, so I think this modem uh, costs $60. This is the cell uh, Wi-Fi GPS modem. It itself costs $60. With that, you get 500 megs uh, of data over a 10-year period. Now, the important thing to understand with this modem is you're not going to be sending video files. You're not going to be sending uh, pictures. You're not going to be sending audio files. Uh, you are going to be sending a JSON. So they really like JSON at, J at Blues. Blues likes their JSON too. <laughs> frustrating degree. But anyways, right? So basically, if you're just sending text information, again, GPS information, sensor values, that type of thing, with this, you pay that $60 or $50, whatever the particular card is, you get 500 megs of data uh, over, again, a 10-year period. With that data, you have data that can go out. So as I'm showing you, this can send data up to your servers. The other valuable thing is you can actually receive data. So it can actually receive data from your servers uh, for things to happen. So if you wanted to put like an LCD screen on this, uh, we're going to be doing a project like that to basically create like a very basic uh, like pager system. You can do that kind of thing. Uh, but basically, uh, it can go uh, either way. If you look at this system, whoops, uh, basically, uh, this is the uh, the card uh, that we're using, a little bit bigger. We just They just launched the, the note card cell and Wi-Fi. And so what this does is it connects to the cell network or to a Wi-Fi network, if you actually uh, uh, program that, uh, it is able to get the GPS signal, uh, and then it's able to send information uh, to your servers. Uh, if you go here, you can see there's uh, many different versions of the cards. Uh, so they got the... Uh, uh, note card cellular alone is uh, fifty dollars plus Wi-Fi cell and Wi-Fi is sixty dollars NB is fifty dollars note card Wi-Fi so just the uh, Wi-Fi is ten dollars and the note card low raw is ten dollars too that's for the long range uh, basically uh, the the kit that I got is this uh, blues global starter kit comes in at about a hundred dollars. And so, again, with this, uh, you get the Blues uh, modem, the cell and Wi-Fi modem. Uh, you get the board. You get the uh, the Arduino feather, feather board, uh, and basically everything you need to create a project like we're doing today, other than the, the, the server or whatever that you need to be sending the information to. Um, again, if you take a look at the starter kit, this is all the stuff that comes with the starter kit, uh, and it's a pretty good little deal. So, basically, this is what we're talking about when we're talking with about Blues. So everything that I'm going to show you today, the information, the concepts, the theory can be transferred uh, to other hardware, but a lot of stuff that I'm going to be talking about today is going to be blues uh, and this particular note card specific.
Now, before we get into the technical aspects of this class, we do need to talk about fees and prices. Ah, right, what no noob wants to think about. What is the actual cost of this device in a production environment? And surprise, surprise, it might be a hell of a lot more expensive than you're thinking. So basically, when you look at the Blues platform, it's actually three different components, right? So you have the modem itself. So you buy the modem. You have to buy the modem directly from Blues. And this comes with that 500 megs of data transfer over a 10-year period. And that's built in specifically into here. Now, there's different carriers or hats so that you can use your own Arduino if you want to use uh, the modem or you could use your own Raspberry Pi. So I actually have a Raspberry Pi hat uh, in the mail. It's coming to me so I can start doing projects with Raspberry Pi. I think that'll actually be easier for me. Uh, and so here, uh, basically you have the modem. Again, 500 megs comes with it when you buy the hardware. Uh, then you have either a microcontroller or a computer to control the modem. That's your own cost. Again, whatever the hell it is that you want to pay for. But the important thing to understand is this is a system. So part of their system is something called NoteHub. And so NoteHub is when this is sending information out, it sends directly up to their NoteHub platform. And then NoteHub is able to do something called a webhook. So a webhook is when you send a post of value to a, somebody else's server. So basically I've created my own server on DigitalOcean. When the GPS information goes from here to NoteHub, NoteHub then sends the information on to my DigitalOcean server. If I wanted to send information to this little guy, I would have to send to NoteHub and then it would send the, uh, the, 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 the communication down here. So one of the things you need to be thinking about, again, as a professional, is like, well, that's not too bad, right? I pay my 50 or I pay my $60. I get 500 megs of data over a 10 year period. Done, done easy, right? Unsubscribe for contracts and monthly fees, break free from expensive subscriptions. That sounds great. I'm going to just buy this piece of hardware and I'm done. Which is, of course, of course, you know that's not how it actually works. So when you buy this thing, again, you get 500. You get 500 megs of data uh, from this up to uh, what's called NoteHub, which is their platform. Uh, if you scroll down here, uh, basically it gives you all the prices uh, for the different uh, modems and what they cost. If you need more data, right, it's very reasonable. 500 megs is an additional $10 in North America, $15 international. So it's not too bad. If you need another 500 megs, $10. And again, we're sending JSON here. So depending on how much JSON you send, that's, that, that should not bankrupt you. That should not bankrupt you. <clears throat> where we get into the uh, where we get into the curious part though. So 500 megs from here to NoteHub. Ah, but then there's a communication from NoteHub to your server, or from your server to NoteHub. And that's where things get a bit wacky. So basically with this system, what they have set up, you get 5,000 credits per month, your, your account gets topped up by 5,000 credits per month. So credits are essentially used uh, for all the transactions. So NoteHub services that use credit, a routed event, right? So a web hook, um, an event API retrieval request is one, real-time device messaging, note, uh, note card, web request. So basically almost every request you're going to be making is gonna, going to consume one credit. So every time you deal with NoteHub, right, with one of your systems, that's going to consume one credit. So if you get 5,000 credits per month, basically what that comes out to is if you're running this thing 24 hours a day, 30 days a month, that means you get approximately seven transactions, seven credits you can use per hour. So that's one of the things you need to be thinking about from a design standpoint is, okay, you do this thing and you want real-time communication or near real-time communication or whatever else, you only get seven transactions per hour for those 5,000 credits. If you want to purchase more credits, right, it seems pretty decent. 0. 0. 0.000750 cents. Basically what this means, right, the actual math on that, is it comes out to about 13 transactions per penny, right? So if you have this thing, like doing some kind of, you know, sensor value or whatever, every minute 
it's sending, uh, sending something up to your server. That means every 13 minutes, it's costing you a penny. Every 130 minutes, uh, it's costing you $1.30. Every 1,300 minutes, it's costing you $10.30. If you have a number of different, uh, a number of these uh, out in the field, this can actually start getting expensive very, very quickly. The data you're sending from here all the way to your server might be very small, but the transactions are gonna end up costing you a lot of money. This is something to be very careful about. Beyond that, they have this weird thing, like when you look at the pricing. So from what I can tell, right? So they top up your account every month by 5,000 credits. Now here's the interesting thing. That's the account, that's not per device. So every new modem you buy, they give you 5,000 free credits. But even if you buy 40 modems per their documentation, you will only get topped up by 5,000 credits per month. You don't get topped up by 5,000 credits per modem that you purchase. You can, if you have one modem, you get topped up by 5,000 credits per month. If you have 40 modems, you get topped up by 5,000 credits per month. So this is one of the things that could be like, again, ruinous in the real world for a startup company. If you're not thinking about how often your devices are communicating up with their system and their system is firing the information off to your server, Again, at 13, tra at 13 transactions per penny, it's, it's surprising how quickly that can add up. So that's one of the things to be thinking about. And again, as a technology professional, this is one of the things you need to consider. How are you being charged for things? Oh, 500 megs um, for the price for 10 years. That makes sense. $10 to top that up. That makes sense. You're not thinking about this transaction cost for the Note Hub sending the information from your server and for your server to send information to NoteHub to come back down to this thing. That's where things can get squirrely from a money standpoint. Now, the next thing that I want to talk about with creating this tracking device is thinking about the design philosophy for this type of hardware. This is an important thing to be thinking about when you're trying to build IoT devices is essentially what is what is the culture? What is the design philosophy behind the hardware or the system that you're going to be trying to build your project off of? Again, it's important to understand you, you can know APIs, you can know function calls, you can know subnet masking and all those kinds of things, right? That's the hard technical stuff that we do as technology professionals. But how that gets built into a system can basically be whatever the hell the company wants. And that's where people can run into a little bit of trouble. And that's where I was frankly a little bit confused with this Blues system, right? So the big thing with Blues is that they want this to consume as little power as possible, right? So I'm, I'm uh, powering this thing right now off of a USB battery pack, but you can charge, uh, you can uh, power this off of a LiPo battery or some other kind of power source. And their idea is that you could put this into the field potentially for a long, long time. You could put a little solar cell on it so they can recharge every day, or you could just put a big ass battery on it and maybe that'll keep it running for a year or two again you got to think about the voltages and all that but that might actually be possible and so their idea is they want it to be as efficient as possible and so one of the issues that you get into with this is that they they turn off a lot of stuff <laughs> One, they turn off a lot of stuff. When you get this by default, the GPS is turned off, right? So the GPS, one of the reasons you buy this thing, you actually have to turn the darn thing on in order to make it work. Not only that, but when you do turn it on, right, you can either put it to continuous mode or you can put it to periodic mode. Continuous mode means it's going to be burning a lot of electricity uh, because it's going to be always on getting the GPS signal. They don't really like that. So one of the things they have is something called a periodic mode. What the periodic mode does is basically every X number of seconds, it can turn on to get whatever its current GPS location is. So that's what I have here is I think it's every five minutes, basically the GPS unit turns on and gets whatever its current location is. Uh, and then it's, it sends that up to NoteHub, which then it goes to my server. Uh, and so that's one of the things you need to be thinking about. Again, with tracking units is, you know, how is this stuff gonna work? Another thing with trying to save power is that it will not get a new GPS reading unless it's felt that it's moved, right? So it has an accelerometer built into this. So basically, if it does not feel that it's moved, it will not turn on the GPS unit. 
because why turn on the GPS unit unless it's moved? Again, depending on your system, that actually makes a lot of sense. Technically, that makes a lot of sense. But depending on what you're designing and what what uh, you know your your system needs to be cleared for, that might uh, turn into a problem. And so that's some of the things uh, to be thinking about uh, with kind of like the design philosophy for this. Uh, beyond that, there's something, it's able to find its location uh, through triangulation. So basically triangulation is where it uses the, the cell phone towers uh, and other things like Wi-Fi signals and that type of thing to try to figure out where its location is. Uh, by default, uh, it'll actually do that only once per day. So the idea is if this is a static IoT device, it will figure out what its location is once per day and then it will We'll just retain that in its memory because why burn the elect extra electricity redoing the triangulation if this is something that's supposed to be static? Again, that might be fine. If you have a static device, that might be absolutely fine. But if you have a device that's moving around, right? Again, think about this. Just because this does tracking, right? Doesn't mean it's actually tracking when you think it's going to be tracking, right? As it moves around, if it only tri it triangulates or gets data uh, once per day, you will get that same value going into the future because it basically until the next 24 hour period has gone by and so it gets that that new triangulation value again and so that's going to be one of the things when you're when you're dealing with this is trying to figure out basically how all of this kind of stuff works and basically creating uh, the, the proper configurations so everything works well together uh, one of the other issues you get uh, from a design philosophy is that the LTE or the the cell signal and the GPS signal don't work at the same time. That was frustrating to figure out. So it does have a GPS unit and obviously it does have the cell modem. Here's the thing, when the GPS unit's on, the cell is not communicating. When the cell is on, the GPS can't communicate. So that's one of the other issues that you can run into is you can't actually have a continuous cell signal and a continuous GPS signal at the exact same time because you run into problems. And so even though this has a GPS unit built into it, even they recommend if you need more like real-time tracking information that you should actually add your own additional GPS unit to the system if you if you need uh, more you know uh, basically GPS information updated at a more regular pace. So this is just some of the stuff to be thinking about with this hardware. And again, when you go out there to start building your own projects, these are kind of some of the pitfalls that you can run into. So now let's take a moment to talk about tracking with this particular modem. Again, it's important to understand how your little IoT device is actually doing anything. One of the interesting things with the Blues IoT modem is it can actually track in three different ways. So it has the GPS unit uh, on board, so that's the normal GPS that you would normally use. Uh, it has the ability to do what's called triangulation, uh, and what triangulation is is basically uh, where it gets the signal from the from the cell towers it also pull it finds things such as the Wi-Fi signals that are in the area. It sends all of that information up to NoteHub. NoteHub does some processing to say what the geographic location of where you currently are. So the GPS can actually be completely off and especially if you're in a business type environment, you can still get a surprisingly good uh, location value for where you're at. Uh, the final thing is then uh, tower information. So this will communicate with the cell tower, obviously Obviously, it knows what cell tower it's communicating with, and so it can actually get the GPS coordinates of the tower it's communicating with. Uh, basically, if nothing else, uh, then you'll know, you know, a general area of where this device is. Uh, so this is the JSON. Again, have I told you how much Blues likes their JSON? They love their JSON. Anyways, so this is uh, JSON values. This is what's going to be sent up to my server. Uh, Basically, there's three different ways uh, to get the location. So it'll try to figure out what the best location type is. So for this, it's pulling the GPS location. The best location, the best lat is a latitude, best longitude is here. Best location will tell you it's Asheville, North Carolina and the United States uh, in America. Um, if we come down, uh, we can see uh, we have the tower. Uh, so the tower, uh, latitude and longitude. So this is the location of the tower that this thing is communicating with. Uh, and if we come down here, we get the triangulation value. And so that triangulation value gives uh, different coordinates. 
And so this is, again, one of the things you need to be thinking about with precision. Again, how important is it that your device is precise, is good enough, good enough. So if you have this device, it's running around, it can't get the GPS signal for some reason, it can't triangulate for whatever reason, but it can get that cell phone tower information, right? That might be the value that you're getting. Is it good enough to know that somebody is in a particular area, even if you don't know the specific location, like the actual address that person is at. Uh, basically, if we go up and we take a look at location, uh, so this is where they just break out. So again, the GPS location, the tower location, and the triangulated location. So if I click on this uh, for the GPS location, uh, basically it will show me in the wrong place. One of the things that I'll say, one of the things I'll say about this modem, the GPS kind of sucks. I mean, so I'm here, I'm here, it's saying that I'm over there based off of GPS, which is pretty far off. Uh, the interesting thing though, is if we go up here and we do triangulated, we do that triangulated, um, we can see that it puts me right here, uh, which is actually basically uh, about right. It's putting me on the sidewalk instead of in the building, uh, but otherwise, and again, the sidewalk's only about 20 feet away from me, so that makes sense. So GPS was all the way over here, and the triangulated is here. One of the things you have to be concerned about is again, you have the best. It's saying what is the best value? As I showed you in the JSON, it's deciding that the GPS is the best value. Even though we take a look at it and it's absolutely not the best value, and so again, that's just kind of one of those things you gotta keep in your mind about how you're gonna be dealing with this. Uh, then the tower, uh, so this is the tower information. I can click on this map. Uh, and then it'll basically show me uh, where the tower is, right? So uh, my triangulated value was here, my GPS value was here, and I guess the tower that I'm communicating with is over here. Uh, so these are the three different location values that this modem is getting. And one of the things that you'll need to be thinking about when you develop your application is basically which one of these values are you going to trust? Um, and again, what is, what is the precision that you're expecting out of this particular system? Now let's take a moment to do a brief introduction to NoteHub. We're going to go into this a little bit more later, but I want you to understand what's happening here when we get, actually start diagramming out the architecture. So we have the modem. The modem is its own thing. You actually do configurations within the modem. You then have a computer or you have a microcontroller that uses the information that comes in from the modem uh, to be able to trigger events for the modem to send information up to NoteHub. When information then comes into NoteHub, you can create your projects. So I have this test project right here. If I click on this, we see a whole bunch of different information, right? So I can take a look at my devices. Uh, this shows me my device uh, with all kinds of different information here. One of the big things is the events, right? So the events, this is basically the communication that is coming in from our little tracking device into the note hub system so it's being stored here now it's important to understand though at this point it is just stored here that doesn't actually do us any good they don't have any vps server they don't have any uh, virtual private servers they don't have any databases this is just here so what you do is you create a route right and so with routes i have this tracking route and basically what this is is it is a web hook uh, so i have this server on DigitalOcean, uh, 165.232.147.153, port 80, and then I have a page for receive. So what's happening here is the, uh, the Arduino triggers the modem to send a communication, to send an event up to uh, NoteHub. NoteHub receives that communication. It then routes, it routes that communication using a webhook to this server and to this page that is able to receive post events on that particular server. And then the server is able to deal with everything past that. And I'll explain that in a minute as far as the architecture is concerned. And so this is how this basic system works of how the information goes from uh, the modem and from the Arduino up to NoteHub and then gets routed out to our server. So now you got all of that. Okay, this is where we're, I'm going to explain the entire architecture of this system and all the noobs out there are going to start to understand why I laugh when new people ask me what programming language they should learn. Eli, what technology will get me a job? 
And it's like, oh golly, that's only slightly better than saying you want to do computers, right? Because there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes into this. And to be clear, this is a dirt simple project. So anyways, so we go all the way over here, right? And down here, basically, we have our little blues modem. And our blues modem, we actually do have to configure. We have to, put, you use JSON in order to configure the blues modem. And in the blues modem, uh, you turn on the GPS, you turn on the GPS, to, or you, you have a setting for it to periodically check, uh, check for a GPS signal every certain amount of time. Uh, you configure it to actually be able to communicate with your project and all that kind of stuff. And so there's actually configuration within the blues modem that you have to do that are only on the blues modem. That blues modem then is connected to our little dev board and to our Arduino. And in the Arduino is Arduino code. That's basically we're importing libraries, uh, we're, we're setting a configuration values for Arduino itself, and then based off of things that are, that are occurring with the Arduino, we'll trigger a, 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 a communication from the modem up to NoteHub. Uh, and so with this, again, uh, we're going to be doing more projects with this into the future. And this is where like you can add sensors to this. So you can have a sensor uh, on this uh, particular de dev kit, like a motion sensor, something like that. Basically, you can configure the Arduino every time the PIR, the motion sensor, detects motion, send something up to NoteHub, again, to tell somebody something's going on. Again, imagine in a security scenario, you have security officers, they're supposed to be wandering around. Basically, what if you put up uh, motion sensors all over your facility that aren't necessarily connected with Wi-Fi or whatever? Whenever there's a motion event, they can be alerted and they can just trot along to see, hey, what's going on wherever that motion is, right? So anyways, you code all of that into Arduino, or if you want to make more complicated things, you co code that in uh, with a Pi. And so that's uh, either Arduino code, which is a variation of C, or if you're in Pi, uh, you're dealing with Python. From here, the signal goes up, basically, you know, gets on the, the gets on the, the, the cell uh, network, and from there it goes to NoteHub. All right, so NoteHub is their platform. That again, I will remind you, it costs you one cent per 13 transactions. I will beat that into your head because I know, I know what the young people out there are like, Eli, Eli, it's 13 transactions for a penny. Why do you keep talking about that, right? I thought you were a successful technology professional. Why do you care about pennies, Eli? Because under load, under load, <laughs> in production, pennies add up horribly quickly. So do be careful. So anyways, oh, the information goes up uh, to NoteHub. You have what is called a web hook. Uh, in uh, NoteHub, and basically all this is, is a URL to the server uh, that you want to send your data to, all right? So basically, up until this point, there's actually not a hell of a lot you can do with the data. You can create the data, you can send the data up, or from there, you're not really doing a lot. This is where it gets interesting, right? So I have a, what is called a VPS, on uh, DigitalOcean, VPS, so a virtual private server, an instance of a server. It has an internet facing IP address. What this means is that basically something on the internet can send communication directly to it without port forwarding or anything like that. This is something you're gonna have to think about from an architecture standpoint. If you have a server inside your facility, you can't necessarily webhook into that server unless you do some port forwarding or some other screwy stuff, right? So the server uh, that you're going to have uh, is going to have to have that, I, that, that web facing IP address. So anyways, it comes in here. I have Ubuntu uh, on the server and I am using uh, a, uh, a web app framework for Python uh, called Bottle, right? So Python is a programming language. There are frameworks basically to extend the functionality of programming languages. Uh, and so Bottle is an incredibly easy to use web app framework that allows you to build web applications with Python. So basically in Bottle, oh, I think I have a receive page, uh, as I said. So when the post value comes in, to that receive page, it's able to take that post. And what it does is it parses the information coming in, right? So it gets the, the timestamp. So the timestamp from, uh, from the modem, uh, it grabs that. 
it grabs the, the, the best latitude and the best longitude. So again, that was a decision that I made just for this particular project. What longitude and what latitude do I get? Do I get the GPS? Do I get the triangulated? Do I get the tower? Or do I let the system pick, even if it's wrong? Ah, you know, sometimes you sometimes you go for the easy one. So I just pick the best, right? So so best lat and best long, right? So that information. So timestamp, best lat, best long. That is all gra grabbed, and that is put into a SQL light database. So my two favorite tools right now are Bottle for web app development and SQLite for relational databases. Basically, if you want something as simple to manage as a text file with all the power of SQL, SQLite is the way to go. So basically, uh, we use an insert and we insert those values into the SQLite database. So that is how information goes into our system. Right? But then we got the user. All right, so we got the user down here. We got the boss. We got the, we got the cigar chomping boss. Want to make sure his employees are doing everything their employees are supposed to be doing, right? And so he's got his little cell phone. He's got his little cell phone, and he's trying to see the location of this particular modem to make sure that his employees are working. So basically what happens here is your smartphone uh, or your computer uh, communicates up with that bottle server. Again, has that external IP address. So you could have you could have a URL for this. You know, you could have you know crappyapp.com. Uh, Somebody could go to crappyapp.com to look for the the GPS uh, for for the location for this. Basically, it goes up. Right from here, uh, there is a current file. So there is a uh, there is a path called current. So there's the IP address slash current. And that's within the bottle configuration. What current does is it grabs, right, from SQLite, it grabs the last five values. I just set that up for, you know, ease of purposes, right? It grabs the last five uh, lats, longs, and timestamps. And it takes those values as a text uh, value. Basically, it goes, it does a SQL, uh, it does a select statement, take, brings those back, and then it has those values as, as text values. Now, what are you going to do with that, right? Again, one of the things we have to be thinking about is from a user standpoint, you can give users precise information in a format that's worthless. It's 100% right and 100% worthless at the exact same time. So what do we really want? We want something graphical for our cigar chomping boss to be able to look at so they know what the hell they're actually looking at. So what happens is after we get these five uh, values for lat, long, and timestamp, basically what we do is we go to Google. So we, there's the Google Map API. And so for this, we feed lat and long five different times. So we do a loop. And then Google Map, basically what, what we do is we create the first map, and then we loop, and then we create the second map, and the third map, and the fourth map, and the fifth map. And so we write all of this out in HTML with a Google map embed. And then we send that to the user. And the user can now see what I was showing you before, where you have those five embeds of the last five places uh, that the, uh, the, the system detected where it was at. And so this, this is what the architecture looks like. We configure things on the modem. We configure things within the Arduino. We configure things within NoteHub. We build our own Ubuntu server with Python, with Bottle. We set up our own SQLite server, which is actually very easy. That's one of the reasons I like SQLite. When the post information comes in, we store the data in the SQLite server and the SQLite database. When the user makes a request to see the last five locations people are, basically that goes up to the Bottle server through the current, right? URL, current URL goes to that database, pulls the last five lat lawn values. I just configured that. You can figure it however you want. Takes those to Google Map API in order to create the embedded maps. All of that then gets written to an HTML file that gets sent back to the user. And there you go. There is some architecture for you.
So now that we understand a bit about the architecture, let's talk about how we configure the modem itself. So I'm not going to do a lot of the commands that I use in order to configure the modem. I will put that into the notes so you can follow along at home if you want to go into it, just because, again, everything here has to be in JSON, and it can get confusing pretty quickly, and I, I don't want to mess up my little tracking device today. So anyways, uh, when you go to Blues, uh, there will be a developer page, basically there'll be a quick start guide there and through that as you go through the process you will get to the point where it will sh give you basically uh, this kind of command line thing on the side of the web page so that you can interact uh, with your uh, with your modem one of the important things to understand uh, when you're connecting to this to your system is that you do need to connect the USB connection to to the expansion board and not to the Arduino. So you can power uh, this, you know, through the expansion board uh, and that's fine. But when you're going to be modifying the Arduino, you have to connect into the Arduino. And when you're gonna be modifying the modem itself, you have to be uh, connected into the expansion board or you will run into problems. So basically if you go to do a connection right here, so you see this little USB thing for the connection. Right, if you go to do a connection and it fails out, most likely you've connected to the Arduino and not to the expansion board. Uh, basically, once you're able to connect, uh, I can enlarge this and uh, you can plug in commands here. So I'll just, uh, oh, I'll just do an up thing just to, just to get this done. Um, See if I make that big enough so you can see. So this is how you send a command to the blues modem. So the, the squigglies, open squiggly, close squiggly. You do uh, quotation marks, rec, and then colon, card.version. And when I do that, uh, that is what gives me the information uh, about this particular card. So, uh, so this is the card, this is the device, the name, uh, Wi-Fi true, cell true, GPS true. Uh, it gives me a whole bunch of other information. So when I want to go through uh, and I want to do any configurations or such, uh, basically that's what I do. Um, if I want to go over here, let's say I want status. So I want status of the card. I can do control C just to make my life easier. That's one thing I will tell you. Uh, when, you when you're dealing with blues, I would highly recommend you come up with your own little page for notes just to make your life easier. Um, I put that in there. Uh, let's see here. Card status. Uh, so USB, it's connected to USB power is true. Normal gives me the time. Sell true. Uh, journey true, basically, if it's moving or not. Uh, and so this gives me some additional information. Uh, if you want to do configurations, it's the same type of thing. Um, so for the periodic, control C. Oh, if I do this, uh, I'm not actually going to run this, though. So we can do rec card.location.mode, mode equals periodic, as I said, seconds 300. So what this means is for the GPS, it's periodically gonna turn on the GPS every 300 seconds, which comes out to five minutes. It's your decision on how often it does that, right? Uh, and so you would run this command uh, and then it would actually send that, that, uh, that setting uh, into the modem itself uh, so that it's configured that way. Uh, so again, I will have notes uh, in, in GitHub and the other places that I put notes for this on how you do some of this stuff. I just wanna give you this overview here because, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a pain in the butt. Then the next thing that you have to do is you have to configure the Arduino or the Raspberry Pi. Honestly, after I've been doing this for a little while, I think I'm going to be using Raspberry Pis going into the future. It is, I think it's much easier to use Python. But if you want to use an Arduino, there is Arduino code. Basically, you connect this thing in. One of the important things to understand is that whenever you're going to upload new code, you actually have uh, to reset the entire card. Uh, so you push in the power button, uh, then you they hold in the boot button for a second, then you release both and that should reset the card so that you can upload the new code that you've created. If you try to upload code and it fails out, most likely you have not reset the card. Now, when you go uh, by Blue's way of doing this, uh, they want you to be using... Um, 
uh, VS Code. VS Code is the best way to go for coding. Uh, and basically, there is an extension called Platform IO that they want you to install. And this actually allows you to code for our Arduino and be able to upload the code directly from VS Code so that you do not need the Arduino IDE. Uh, there is an I, uh, INI file. So if you're going to be uploading uh, to your um, to your uh, Arduino through this. Uh, they want you to change this upload protocol to DFU, uh, and then the rest of this information is here. Uh, you may need to modify this depending on your particular project or depending on your particular card, but basically once you modify it, it should be fine. From there, we create the main.cpp, or actually you're just gonna, basically it's gonna create the main.cpp for you, and then you're able to add things in. And if you take a look at this, uh, this is basically uh, Arduino code. Um, I was using uh, the, uh, the pseudo sensor um, library for a little while there. I forgot to remove that. Uh, but basically we have the Arduino library here and we have the note card uh, library here. This imports everything that we need uh, for this to work. And then if you want to do the pseudo sensors, you can do that. Um, I'm actually not using that in this particular project today. Uh, we create a namespace. Um, I'm going to create a message. So I have a hello world message. Every time this fires off, it's going to say hello world to the platform because it's geeky that way. Uh, we're going to have a USB serial connection and we're going to find our product ID. So basically this is the project that this thing is going to be communicating with. Uh, so this is my company name um, and then this is the, uh, the, the, the project that it's going to be going towards. Uh, note card, we create a value for note card. We do the setup, so we delay by 2,500 seconds as this thing's booting up. Serial begin at uh, 115,000 uh, kilobits per second. We're gonna begin the note, uh, note card and we're gonna uh, set a debug output stream to the USB serial. So if there's any problems, that'll go to the USB serial. Uh, this is where we create some values for the note card, uh, the product information, the mode information, that type of thing. Um, and then we come down here and then this is the loop. With this, this is basically just the standard loop that it's going to go through. Uh, rec, note card dot new request, note dot add. So all of these uh, files that are being sent up are called notes, right? So note hub, you send notes from your modem to note hub, right? So note dot add. If rec is not null, uh, basically we're going to send this information. Uh, so this is the file we're going to send it to. So sensors.qo, you can do multiple files up on NoteHub. I'll show you that in a second. Uh, synchronization. Then we have this body. So this body, these, these are the JSON values that are going up. So I'm going to have a message value, and that message value is going to be hello world. So this is where you would put in your sensor values, right? So if you have a temp temperature sensor value, if you have a PIR, a motion sensor value, this within this body area, that's where that would be set. Uh, send request, so this is where we send up to, uh, up to Note Hub, and then we're gonna delay. So 300,000, so in um, Arduino world, you deal with uh, microseconds, so 1,000 microseconds. Uh, in a second, so we need 300. So in order to delay by five minutes, you need 300,000 microseconds to get there. And again, that's one of the things that can really screw you up with programming languages. This thing, you need 300 seconds. The modem, you do it 300 seconds. The, uh, the Arduino, you do it 300,000 seconds. Both of them are five minutes, but again, it's how you write it all out. So basically, uh, this is what the Arduino code will look like. You import your, uh, your libraries uh, up at the top. You do some configurations, and basically, the real thing that you're gonna be looking at here is basically this is where you're gonna be adding objects into the body uh, for the different information that you wanna send up to Node hub and so now we get to node hub right we did the modem configuration we did the arduino or the pi configurations it's now sending information up to node hub and this is where we get to our projects uh, you can create a new project and the right hand side uh, your billing information what your project name is here and then what your product id is so basically all of these different devices can be sending to the same product id so they all have their own device id and so again it could be 
a product ID for for motion motion security system for college campus, right? So that could be the product. And then all of the devices that are communicating with that particular product will communicate, right? So they have drill underscore bit here, and that's where I have, um, you saw in the other thing, the IoT demo, right? So if I go here, I do uh, project settings, and uh, we scroll down and we look at actions, we can see uh, basically IoT demo, that is the, the product uh, that this particular tracking device is sending to. And so that's how that works. Uh, once we get up here, Again, you have fleets, so fleets of devices. Again, like if you have if you have customers or clients, and you want to create different fleets, so the, this device is in that fleet, and another device is in a different fleet. You can set that kind of thing up. Uh, this is where the events come in. So when the events come in, this gives you the information, right? So it'll show you the file. So that sensor .qo, uh, right? It says hello world. It says hello world two there. But basically, the value is coming in, and this is the file that it's being sent to locations. .qo, session.qo, health.qo, and then these are the JSON values, because remember, Blues loves their JSON, everything is JSON, right? Um, so with this, I can click on one of these, double click. Uh, this gives me a whole bunch of information here. I can see the location, right? So this takes the GPS, the tower, and the triangulated location. Now again, depending on how often it gets a new location, that may be more or less correct. Uh, then we look at the body. So the body is just the message that's being sent up, right? So with this, it just simply says, hello world two. It strips out everything else in the JSON just so it's easier to see. And then here, we can actually take a look at the JSON. And this is with the JSON, right? The body, the body is here. But then we also have the location values, time values, all of that other kind of stuff in this JSON. And so all of this is what's going to be sent using a webhook uh, to my server. We then have routes. Uh, so basically, we can see we have this route, 165.232.147.153 at port 80 to receive. Uh, and what happens then is I can go here and I can say what files I want to be sent. So location.qo file and sensor.qo file. So when those files come in from my little modem, uh, that JSON value gets automatically sent to my server. So I can only have one of these be sent if I want it, because these are JSON values. I could have all of them be sent. But again, remember, you're paying one CC. You're paying one credit for every transaction. So you got to think about how that's going to work out. That's one of the reasons I only want to send those two. And so basically, that's what's happening. When one of those two files comes in, they get sent to the server. Uh, we can take a look at the logs. So again, if the server is up, if the server is down, to verify everything's happening. When you see a status 200, so status 200 means everything worked out okay. And again, I can click on this. And it can give me, you know, location information and body and JSON and all the stuff that uh, we were talking about before, just to verify everything is working properly, right? Uh, so that is the events, uh, and that is the tracking. We can go into settings, uh, coming here to settings, again, we have kind of the project name, the project UID. I'm not sure I should show you that, but oh well. This is a class. Uh, there's transformation. Uh, so if we want to do some transformation, we can add stuff there. Again, down at the end, um, I think there's uh, some transformation stuff that we can do. And basically, this just puts a lot of stuff in here that you can look for configurations. Uh, connectivity assurance. So when my little device runs out of bandwidth, not runs out of events, not runs out of CCs, but runs out of bandwidth, you can have it automatically rebill your credit card. Again, you have to decide if that's the kind of thing that you want to do. Uh, and then if we scroll up here, uh, this is the, one of the interesting things. And this is where it can get confusing using these new platforms, especially if you're not used to it, where different configurations are different places. So the GPS location, you have to set that up in the modem. In order to fire the event, you have to set that up in the Arduino. So the triangulation event. So the triangulation event is where uh, your device tries to figure out where it is based off of cell towers and Wi-Fi signals and all those kinds of things. This is actually set up within NodeHub. If the note card is configured to collect triangulation data, it will attempt to collect necessar uh, data necessary to perform geolocation if it detects that it has moved since the last attempt at triangulation. NoteHub will process this data no more often than the set rate for the more information. So by default, if we go edit here, the default is daily. So if it feels that it's been moved, it will re-triangulate 
its location once per day. So no, no matter what you coded in the Arduino, no matter what JSON you set up in the modem, if you do not modify this, you're not going to get new triangulation data. So you have to be careful here. And again, do you never want to do it hourly, four times a day, two times a day, or unlimited? The big thing here is that this is going to consume power on your IoT device. Again, remember, whenever any process fires off on your little IoT device, that's going to consume electricity. So the more times it's triangulating what its position is, the more electricity you're going to burn. And so that's one of the things to consider uh, when you're thinking about this. Uh, if we go down, we take a look at things like... Um, leave page we go take take a look at things like usage uh so it, it shows me here like the routed events and again you can route a lot of events i routed 446 events uh, a couple of days ago remember i get 5,000. i get 5,000 credits per month and in one day of just playing around i used 550. This is the kind of thing you really have to be careful about as a tech professional. Uh, but basically, that's the idea of how NoteHub works. So now let's go over and take a look at the code uh, on our server. So now in order to create the server that that webhook is going to, so basically a webhook is simply a post value. So you know how you create an HTML form and the method you put post and you click the button and then it sends, sends the value to some script that you created somewhere. That's the exact same thing with a webhook. Basically a webhook is just an automated version of that, right? The information comes in uh, to, the, to the API platform. It sends it out immediately or whatever the, that system is set up for to, to a script on your server for your server to process that information and do whatever it is that you want to do. Uh, so all you need for this is you need a web facing server. So an IP address that is internet facing, again, not necessarily in your house, unless you know how to do port forwarding and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, I use DigitalOcean just because just one of those things. I don't know. It's easy to use, not too expensive. You can use Linode. You can use AWS or Azure if you know how to set stuff up. You can use any VPS. You just need that internet facing IP address. Uh, with this, um, I did uh, get the, uh, the larger uh, version of the um, of the droplet so i actually got the uh the one gig uh, of ram with the 10 gigs of disk space disk space with the you know improved intel processor i did originally go with a four dollar per month version so this is eight dollars i went for the four dollar per month version and i have to say the ssh <laughs> kept failing out i was trying to modify things and ssh kept failing all the damn time um so it's one of those things, you know, how smoothly do you want this project to run? Does a couple of dollars actually matter to you? If you don't care about an extra $4, again, the $8 a month version seems to work well. Uh, so I've got Ubuntu on there that has Python. We got the IP address. Uh, if you go with DigitalOcean, they have a whole bunch of instructions for when you're setting up, you know, Python scripts to run on DigitalOcean. Uh, you do need to create a user account uh, that your script is going to be running under. You do need to create a virtual environment uh, for that user account and for that script. And then you run the script within that virtual environment. If you just leave the root user, disaster will ensue. Uh, past that, um, I've just been manually running this because again, this is just a test project right now. But if you want to set up the, the bottle script to run as a service, again, they've got a bunch of documentation for that. Basically, if you run it as a service, when the system boots, it will automatically start the bottle script. If you need to stop the bottle script, if you need to restart the bottle script, that can all be done uh, directly from the command line. It makes life a little bit easier. Right. Anyways, uh, past that, uh, if we go over, uh, we can take a look at the script. So this is all Python, uh, Python that we all now know uh, we all love. Right. Uh, so from bottle, import route, run request and post. So bottle is this framework. Again, you do pip3 uh, install bottle that will install the framework into your virtual environment. We import JSON because we need to deal with JSON. We import SQLite 3 because we need that. And from date time, we're going to import date time because we're going to need to be able to turn Unix timestamps into something that's human readable. We then need the Google Map API key, right? So in order to get those embedded um, maps, we need an API key from Google Maps. So that's where we have here. Uh, and then we have the connection for SQLite. So SQLite, again, is a relational database. The nice part with it is simply by calling it, it creates it, which makes life really easy. So connection equals SQLite.connect to location.db. So this will be our database. 
Uh, then we're gonna create what's called the cursor here, cursor execute, create table if it doesn't exist, location, ID is integer, primary key, auto increment. So basically it's a primary key, it goes up as you go. Timestamp equals text, line equals text, long equals text, and that executes. So if this table does not exist, it will get created, right? Very nice. Then we do connection.commit. So if you don't do this, that doesn't actually happen. Always make sure to commit. We have latitude, old equals nothing. Longitude, old equals nothing. We'll deal with that later. Then we have the two, um, the two functions that we have in this bottle script. So we have current. So current, basically that shows us the maps, right? And then we have receive, and this is the post. When the webhook comes in, this is the function that will do something with that data. Then at the end, again, this is one of the reasons I like bottle, is simply by running this script, everything works. You don't have to go and do other things. So run host at 0.0.0.0. .0. So basically that means on the external IP address, at port 80, debug true. Whether or not you want debug true is on, it's probably not a good idea, but I have it on just because of this test scenario. So basically at my IP address, at port 80, and if there's a problem, tell me what the problem is. So let's go down and take a look at receive. So receive is when the values come in. Uh, what I'm going to do here is, okay, so at post. So here, at post, this is telling uh, bottle that this is going to be a post value, that post information is coming in, at receive, at slash receive. And then we're going to just define the function. Global, lat old and lawn old, right? So lat old and lawn uh, old is up there. I just made them global to make life easier. Data equals JSON loads request body read decode UTF-8. So what this means is, is when we load in the request, we're going to read it as JSON, and we're going to save all of that to the data variable value. If data best lat does not equal lat old and data best long does not equal long old, do this. So basically, if it's the exact same value, I don't want to store it in the database just to clunk up the database. So basically, if it's a new value, I'll save it in the database. If it's the same value as we had before for some reason, we won't. SQL, insert into location, timestamp, lat long, values, question mark, question mark, question mark, cursor.execute, SQL, so execute the SQL, and we're gonna put in uh, data, data received, so received is the timestamp, data best lat, that's gonna be the lat, data best long, that's gonna be the long, we're gonna commit, because that's what actually processes the SQL statement, and we're gonna print out data added, else we're gonna print out data not added, Lat old equals whatever the current best lat is. Lawn old equals whatever the current best lawn is. And so we use that. So again, we don't, we don't keep saving the exact same information. Uh, we're gonna print out lat, best lat, lawn, best lawn, old lat, lat old, old lawn, old lawn. So that will just print out on the screen. Um, and then uh, we're gonna return hello for some reason. Anyways, uh, so basically, uh, this is what happens. So basically, when the post that JSON post value comes in, what'll happen is that that'll be taken. We're gonna get the best lawn and the best lat. We're gonna put the best timestamp. We're gonna insert that into the SQL database if it's not the same as what we got before. And so now it's going to be sitting in the database. We're gonna close. Uh, we're gonna minimize this. So now let's go take a look at the current function. So at route, so this is route. So when people come to my web server and I go, they go to current, this function is gonna fire off, right? And this is going to provide those embedded uh, maps that I showed you before. Uh, SQL equals select all from location, order by ID, descending limit five. So basically this is going to take the last five um, values that have been inserted into the database and it's going to return those. Cursor.execute SQL. So again, we got to execute in order to make this work. Uh, and then location equals cursor dot fetch all. So basically the SQL statement is going to run and then location is going to be fetch all the values from that SQL statement. Page, page is going to be the value that gets returned to the, to the user that is going to the page. And we're just going to make that blank here for the moment. 4x in location. So when this comes back, this basically comes back um, as a as a as a data set. 
with indexes. So we're going to say 4x in location, right? So basically for 1, for 2, for 3, for 4, and for 5. Page equals page. Uh, so whatever page was before. So the first time it goes, it's blank. H3, date time uh, from timestamp. So basically it's going to give us a human readable timestamp here. Latitude is going to be X2. Longitude is going to be X3. So X, X1 is timestamp. X2 is latitude. X3 is longitude. Close the H3, do a break. Then this is where we have the embed uh, for, the, uh, for the, the, the Google map, right? Uh, I had the option of doing JavaScript. JavaScript was actually much longer, more, much more complicated. I thought this was an easier way to go. And so basically here, so page equals, we start with an F string, page, so everything that's been added to the page before. We do an iframe, width of 600, height of 450, border style zero, lazy loading, basically refer policy. Then we'd have the SRC, right? So this is the API call. We go to google.com, maps, embed, v1, place, key. We do the API key here. And then what are the values that we're sending? So we're going to send lat, so this is lat, comma, long. So basically what it's going to be doing is it's going to make sure the API key works. It's then going to search based off of this lat long value. And then it's going to send back a map embed that's 600 by 450 in that iframe. And basically we're doing a 4x loop. So it's going to loop through until all five values have been done. And so that's going to give us five maps. Then we're going to come down here. We're going to return page as a string just to make sure the text goes properly. And that is what is going to give us uh, our web page. So this is what the bottle code looks like. And so this has the, uh, the, the SQLite database here. Uh, this has the post values coming in, the information being saved into uh, the SQLite database. And then with the route current, when somebody goes to that, they will go to that database, pull the lat long and timestamp and then create those five individual embeds. And so that's what gets us this, right? This is where we have the five last locations that our employee has gone so that we can track what they're doing. Are the security officers moving around through a facility more or less how they are supposed to? Are our field agents, are they going out and are they being more or less where they're supposed to be, right? Are they just going to the local gas station or going to a coffee shop and sitting there forever, right? That's, that's a big problem. Uh, basically, this allows us to have, again, there's this idea in the technology world, the concept of a single pane of glass. Uh, so systems administrators use a single pane of glass. And the idea is that you can look at one screen and it has all of your metrics and it has all of your information so that you can see what's going on with your network. Uh, are your servers, you know, below 90% CPU utilization? Or is there anything above 90% CPU utilization? Uh, is there latency issues, right? There's all that kind of stuff that you put on a single pane of glass as a dashboard for a system or a network administrator. One of the interesting things, again, in this IoT world is you're able to start creating this single pane of glass uh, for, for your employees and for the activity so that managers and bosses have a better idea of what's going on in their facilities, their organizations, and their business. Again, the nice part about using something like this is you're not dealing with a cell phone with the, with the massive cost of a cell phone and privacy issues and that type of thing. With this type of device, you buy the device. Again, how much you actually pay at the end of the day is a bit of a question mark. But this is the type of device where you could create a system. And again, like an employee could come in, they could log into the system, they could scan a barcode on this tracking device to associate them with that tracking device. They could just put it on a little clip, uh, you know, on their belt, and then they could go out and do their jobs. You could have a very simple system that allows you to track what's going on. Again, uh, projects that we're going to be doing in the future is, again, a pager type system. So not only can you track their location, but you can send pager type information. And the nice part is, is this more or less is all within your own system. So it's all in your own database. You're able to track this information, try to mine it for data that might be valuable for your company uh, and try to keep it a little bit more in-house than, you know, farming everything out to... to all the other you know, service providers or that type of thing. There's a lot of interesting stuff that you can do with this type of device. Again, as long as you, you keep in mind that whole, you know, 
production at scale what the real cost will be there's a lot of cool things here again as we talked about with architecture though you know i, I talk about this with the programmers one of the things i'm surprised about with a lot of programmers is they don't seem to grasp architecture and again when you start looking at all this this is a ridiculous this is a stupidly simple system this doesn't even differentiate amongst different devices right and you see all the crap that has to be created just for this kind of simple thing, right? This is where you need to be thinking about <clears throat> as you start thinking about larger scale deployments, what is that kind of architecture going to look like and how are you going to design for that for your, uh, your company or for your organization? Uh, so I hope, um, I hope this made sense. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of talking. Uh, hopefully you followed along. Uh, again, code will be at GitHub or the other places that I store code uh, for these types of classes. Um, I think more or less almost everything that I did today uh, was either hand coded uh, or is open source. So you should be free to use it. Uh, the, Arduino, the Arduino stuff, I did copy and paste from somebody else and modified that. But I can't imagine there's anything there that's closed. I mean, you saw what it is. It's 50 lines of code. It's no big deal. But just a warning there. Anything that I wrote, you are more than free to use because, frankly, I don't think I could protect it if I wanted to. Um, yeah. And as always, I enjoy teaching this particular class and I look forward to seeing the next one.